Before we commence, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Nunawal and Nambri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work and talk with you today. I wish to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I'd also like to acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's sovereignty over this land was never ceded and that issues of reconciliation, rights and justice remain ongoing. Um, now a bit of detail about today's exceptional speaker. Bradley Mogridge is a proud Murray from the Kamilaroi Nation with 20 years of experience in Aboriginal engagement, water and environmental science. Having worked in applied research, policy development, legislative reviews and project management. Bradley is an Associate Professor of Indigenous Water and part-time PhD candidate at the University of Canberra and freshly resigned Indigenous Liaison Officer for the Threatened Species Recovery Hub under the National Environmental Science Programme. He holds a Master of Science from UTS and a Bachelor of Science from ACU and is a Fellow of the Peter Cullen Trust Science to Policy Leadership Programme. He was named 2019 CSIRO Indigenous STEM Career Professional and has received the 2019 ACT Tall Poppy Award for Science, ACT National Aborigines and Islanders Day Observance Committee Scholar of the Year, as well as the inaugural Academy of Science 2019 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Travel Award. Bradley hopes to encourage future generations to pursue interests in STEM, promote his ancestors' knowledge of water and mentor emerging Indigenous scientists. We're absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Bradley to the School of Sociology seminar series today. And I know, you know, the enrolled people that are dialing now are up to 96, which I think is probably our highest ever figure, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, I, I completely attest to the quality of this speaker and um, the topic area. And it really beautifully aligns with one of our key thematics in the School of Sociology, namely on decolonizing futures in terms of various knowledge production processes and systems of power. Uh, Bradley will talk to us for approximately 30 minutes or so um, on the subject of Indigenous research methodologies and science before we open things up for some discussion. And on that point, um, I think the way we're going to do it, given we've got so many people on there now, is we'll just do the raise hand function at the end and I'll basically um, uh, moderate that and, uh, and ensure that as many people as we can get questions to Bradley. We do have the chat function too, but um, hopefully uh, we'll, I'd prefer to go down the, the sort of the hands up route would be best because I can see the order and keep up with that. Um, so uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Bradley. It's a real honour and pleasure to have you here. And now over to you. Oh, all right, here we go. You ready, everyone? Um, all right, I'll, this is, a, I've been talking about this a few times. I've presented the topic a number of times. There's slides that I've had in my PowerPoint presentations for probably the last 10 years. So there's not much has changed, unfortunately. So I'm still still progressing and banging the table and being a voice um, and getting out there. And I think it's, um, I just want to thank the ANU department and, um, you know, I. Originally, I thought I was just talking to some of the students and then I noticed it exploded on Twitter and um, there was a number of reshares and shares and retweets. So and now I, I have um, 105 participants, holy mackerel. Okay, all right, here we go. First of all, I wanna acknowledge this country. I'm living on Ngunnawal country. Um, I um, have lived here with my family for the last 10 years, grew up in Western Sydney. And um and you know wherever I've lived, I've always acknowledged and and praised the traditional owners of of that country. My country is Kamilaroi, uh, which is northwest New South Wales. So my mob is up towards the you know the, the border rivers and over up into St George as well into Queensland. Um, so Nan was born at Yaraba, which is old old Tumala, the pre Tumala, um, or pre old Tumala, and then pre current Tumala um, two times back. And then, you know, a lot of her old people, that old photo was Wayland Station. Um, um, and, you know, that's, there's, there's her uh, grandparents and, and father in that picture. And, um, you know, those sort of photos are, are treasured. And, you know, um, I suppose why I do what I do is for them. And also the, the, my kids, you know, the next generation of um, scientists, let's hope. I, um, I, I try really hard for them to love science. Um, my son, his name's Kai, and he could be easily science, Kai the science guy, just like 
you know. So, but he he doesn't want to borrow it, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, the photo bottom right is my kids at my my water my water place, Virba Lagoon. Um, it's a has an old story, an ancient story linked to it about the Gadia. Um, and I, you know, I celebrate that part of my knowledge and that part of the country and respect it. Now, Australia only seems to respond to a crisis, which is very, very unfortunate. So, you know, we have the, we had the thousand kilometre blue green algal bloom in the Murray Darling and out of that, we get the National Water Initiative and a new way, a new, you know, those water reforms. We had the mega drought, which was straight after the millennium drought. I don't know what that, the current, this last drought was called. Um, I think maybe the Bureau of Meteorology might need to come up with a, a naming system just like they do for cyclones because we're going to have more and more droughts. Um, is, is this one a, a Mogo, Mogo drought? No, nah, no. Nah. Um, but yeah, millennium drought and, you know, having two massive droughts in the last 20 years, that's not normal, sorry. Um, species extinctions, um, they've already started. We've got climate change extinctions happening. And obviously there's a lot more under pressure as well. You know, we've got coral bleaching after coral bleaching. Um, and you know, there's people out there that question that bleaching. Millions of dead fish in the Lower Darling. Uh, we had some massive events after that and there was a native fish recovery strategy, which was, I was part of a uh, expert panel, which was cool. And there was also a cultural advisory group as part of that strategy to be established. Um, and then we obviously had the devastating fires um, and we had those, those acronyms created. Um, well, I don't even know what they mean, but they were funding opportunities and for dealing with the, the devastating fires. Um, and then I suppose this quote um, from Victor Stefferson, who was on the ABC, Australian story from memory and you know he said give average Aboriginal people a go and you know that's probably my point and, you know as part of this presentation he's talking about when is the time right for us to be at the table you know I think it's now you know we're obviously we're under strange strange scenario um, with, with COVID and things like that but surviving is built into Aboriginal people we're here we're not going anywhere we've always been here and I think it's the time might be right. So this is my meme, Facebook meme, day one in the colony. Um, any chance you could show us how to find water? So we're giving knowledge from day one and obviously where to find food. And, um, you know, so I suppose why has that knowledge exchange stopped? Um, they, they don't seem to ask us anymore. So culture for me is who I, who I am and my mob, family and kin. So as I mentioned, I'm a Kimberley man, living on Ngunnawal country. Respect I have for my elders is maintained. It was, it was, it was, um, it was strong, always growing up. And I know every, every Aboriginal family will be the same. Listening more than talking, the old two, two ears, one mouth. Uh, you got two ears for a reason. So you got to do the double, double listening. And I'm always learning and, and trying to pass on culture to, the, to, my, to my kids and, and whoever else wants to listen. And that's that exchange of traditional knowledge. Language, look, I don't know my language. I know all the rude words. Um, but I suppose that's, that's part of it. But, you know, learning my language is something, you know, that I'd love my kids to, to have. Um, you know, there are opportunities there, but sometimes you've got to pay to learn your own language. And I'd... That doesn't sit right with me, unfortunately. Um, I do what I can. Um, connection to country is important. My cultural places, my, my gali, my water places, and my cultural species as well is, is important as well. So methodologies, well, I suppose the setting. We're always, um, hang on, I'm just gonna move that. We're always the object of Western methodologies rather than the co-contributors or leads. You know, we're always, you know, potentially Aboriginal Australians are, are some of the most researched people on the planet. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be considered, but also needs to change. And I, I, I do believe that Western ways and Western ways of doing miss the relationship of knowledge, country and culture and our ways of knowing and being. You know, I think that that's the only bit that we need. We need to be the ones doing that as well. 
Indigenous knowledge is built upon connection to, as I just sort of said, our country, cultural identity and language, and obviously the complex social systems. You know, those knowledge holders we hold in high esteem, and you know, one day they may be seen as 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 such. You know, because it's um it's something that doesn't happen in our society. You still there, everyone? Um, I'll keep going. Storytelling is essential, is well essential to the, the way we do business. You know, it's our science communication. You know, stories goes in circles. It's not a straight line. And you know, the way we tell stories, you know, you, the yarning circles and a lot of the concentric designs in our in our art. You know, the the circle is a key part of, of of who we are and all the etchings and and petroglyphs and 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 carvings in in rocks and things like that. There, there's concentric circles everywhere. And a lot of those concentric circles represent water as well. However, our storytelling has been perceived as myth and legend, tall tales, folklore, fables, even mumbo jumbo. And I suppose what it does, it moves traditional scientific knowledge from the realm of science into fiction. But unfortunately for us, it's, it's not fiction. You know, it is, it is thousands of generations of observations of this country. You know, and that is the science, I believe. And I'll try and give you give you something to think about. So for me, traditional knowledge in water, of water is science. You know, knowing when and where to find water, the right water to drink, where you can and can't go. So traditional of ongoing understanding, and as I mentioned, the thousands of years of observations of the driest inhabited continent on Earth. So I believe we have something to offer. So time to explore that. And you know that's the hashtag if you want to use it, STEM original, the original STEMologists. My old people were the first scientists, you know, that's you know, we can debate that, but you know, it was before science was a thing and such things as the Royal Academies and things like that. You know, we had our aims um, to survive, that was key on the driest inhabited continent on earth, access access all available resources sustainably. Our apparatus was knowledge of our connected landscapes, and in our in our toolkit, you know, was was country itself, fire, the sky, stars, species, and water. Our methods was observation, stories, language, song, dreaming, law. Our results were still here. We've even survived policies, um, and I think that sustainable. We're able to sustain that, but through it, adapting and mitigating. Um, and I suppose the conclusion is that we've survived and we can replicate that, we're still here. So some examples of, of what's out there, you know, the bush foods and bush medicines that our old people tested time after time to, to obviously get the most out of it. You know, the, the one I always use is Butterwang, the macrosomia in the, in the sandstone country around Sydney, huge orange nut, but it was highly toxic. So it was obviously a way, they worked out a way to actually reduce those, remove those toxins and make it a stable, you know, it was high in starch and things like that. So finding and refining water in the driest inhabited continent. With no surface water, no in groundwater, you know, the no perceptions of hydrogeology um, were needed, you know, but those stories connected those places, you know, like um, I remember listening to an old man in, um, in Catherine where he was talking about all these different, you know, the hot, the hot springs around that part of the world. And he was talking about these water places and they were all connected. You know, there was red water, there was white water, and I think from memory there was black water, and they're all connected because of um, the dreaming stories he had and the, the knowledge that had been passed down. And the colours was related to obviously the soil type and the geology, but he also mentioned that, you know, that they're all connected and the New South Wales, oh, I got the fat controller, but he was the water controller. Uh, water controller back then, um, water commissioner, water controller. Yeah, that's why I got fat control on my head. Sorry, Thomas. Um, he mentioned that, you know, that they spend a, a lot of money drilling and they found out that, you know, they validated that old man's knowledge that they're all connected. So, you know, that sort of thing is still existing out there. When rivers stop running, you know, knowledge of those deep water holes and, you know, we're seeing the lower Darling dry up again after a fresh that come through. Everyone was happy. People were, were singing and dancing, and obviously now we've got the river drying up again. Why is that? It just shouldn't be happening. You know, our old people connected with wetlands, you know, in the, the drying and, and the wetting scenarios, you know, they were the supermarkets for men and women. 
the women had really strong connection to these wetlands. Some of the, a lot of the resources are in there and you know, they are the kidneys of the river systems. So this is a, a map I found in, in a paper where it was a anthropologist from memory talking to some old people in the Pintubi mob in, in central Australia. And the old man at the end of their time together handed the, the researcher a, um, a spear throw which had concentric circles as circles again and there was 50 or 49 49 names each name had a had a meaning had a reason for being there and that what that man had given him was all the water water places in the in his country so they were all connected to groundwater i found this when i was looking at my groundwater um thesis and you know, that, that sort of stuff is, you know, this days could be quite easily a GIS map. But that old man's knowledge of his country was linked to language and place and water. So that was, that was really exciting for me to find. And, you know, that, that knowledge should be celebrated. So, you know, fish traps, some of the oldest engineered structures on the planet. But, you know, back in the day, they were blown up. So get the wall barges down. You know, they, you'd do that to the, the pyramids, I suppose, wouldn't you? No, doubt it. Sea level rise, the last ice age, you know, those coastal people having to adapt and move up to higher ground to survive um, as, as the, the sea level rose. Fires was a key part of the landscape, you know, there was part of the, the, the management system, the toolbox, you know, the right fire for country. You know, um, fire is, is obviously, I don't want to say the pun a hot topic, sorry, but it is, you know, we've just had the most devastating fires seen in southeastern Australia and also other parts of the country and you know there's the knowledge that should have been part of that was traditional knowledge and, uh, and you know having the right fire for country to obviously hopefully you know it'll it'll be perceived in the future and you know things are being in, in train to hopefully make sure that happens um you know astronomy you know that's that's going fantastically at the moment indigenous knowledge of with astronomy and their stories coming out we've got some young um, very good communicators in, in the in this space, and you know that that should be celebrated. Um, those stories about hunting by the stars, but also understanding country and the, the mirrored the mirror image of, of Earth to the to the sky, uh, the big warrumble in in my language, and then you've got stories of volcanism. You know, in Queensland, um, rivers of fire was mentioned in some of those old stories. Is that volcanic activity? And then the Gunditch Maras mobs story about budge bin you know is that potentially one of the oldest stories on the planet you know that that i think that volcanism dates back to about thirty-seven thousand years so you know that that sort of thing sh should be celebrated oh well, here's some papers and you know there's things popping up all the time but unfortunately you know we have to we have to validate our knowledge and i don't know if i'm too comfortable with that terminology but I suppose it's how do we get our old people's knowledge on the same level as Western science? Um, and I know there are processes in science and a lot of scientists won't like me for saying this, but it's, you know, I believe our, our old people are scientists and our knowledge is science. Um, so there's stories of those volcanic activities there. Um, and then obviously that's that, that first one is, um, you know, stories of inundation and sea level rising People in Port Phillip Bay, um, there was a strange geographer special edition. And, you know, there's another example of, of a validation of our knowledge um, linking to stories. And then, yeah, there's a story by a bloke named Mogridge. Um, his master's thesis will hopefully be published in the Queensland Royal Society spring special edition coming soon. Um, so keep an eye out for that one. So 15, year, 15 years later, I'll, I'll get it published. And I suppose the celebration of our knowledge doesn't happen. And you know, you look at that, you look at look at that map. Um, Robert Zooks um, from Grasshopper Geography digitised all all um, waterways on continents. He's done it for a lot of continents. And yeah, you, you look at Australia, you can sort of see the the Murray Darling Basin down in the southeast, the yellow of the Lake Eyre Basin, and then all the all the rivers in the in northern Australia that flow in the wet season and and, and are dry in the in the dry season and then you move to the center and you've just got 
water places that don't flow unless it rains, and that's pretty rare in itself. So the knowledge of this continent and especially the water knowledge, I just don't know why we don't celebrate that. And it's obviously a key part of the way we manage and, and learn about this continent. Also got to think about the diversity in our mobs. Um, we're not all the same. Every mob is different. You know, they have different languages, laws and landscapes, cultural practice, capacity, status and governance as we move into modern terms. But, you know, the way we do business is different. And, you know, thinking about protocols of every mob that you want to engage with or talk to, um, you know, they have a different way of doing business. And obviously we need to, we need to promote that and learn more about that. Here's some, here's some examples of Indigenous knowledge for the Australian curricula. So I was, I was um, very happy to be part of the water one. Um, and uh, Marcia Langton, Professor Marcia Langton, um, was run, run this and, you know, we had some astronomy and also fire curricula that was put up for teachers, you know, because, you know, I'd, I'd heard too many times that teachers were saying, it's too hard, I'm not Indigenous, I don't know how to teach Indigenous knowledge, but also there's no resources. So this was a key part of that. And there's other, there's other resources growing by the, by the day. And, you know, I think these sort of things, there's no excuse now. Um, it should be part, you know, I think about my son who's in year 11 and he has to take Aboriginal studies as an elective, not core learning, which I find sad. So water, I've got to get back to water. It's protected by laureates in our songs, dances and dreaming stories and art. So how are old people knew water? You know, I'm trying to get back to that. Tell our stories and our science our way, taking the space, zooming in, um, find and refine water in a dry landscape. That knowledge is not, not celebrated or taught. The val then we need to value and protect those water places and then val validate the knowledge for our mobs. Um, and then, yeah, there's a, a photo or picture of a piece of art from um, um, a piece of art from, from my collection. And it's um, linked to my um, totem through my through my um, mum. It's a yeah by the, the carpet snake. So this is the front door um, and hopefully protects us and strangles someone if they're, they're not welcome. Let's see. There we go. Here's here's what I these these are some of the points that I've been talking about over the last ten odd years. And you know the oldest surviving culture. We don't have a water voice. And, you know these are absent due to because you know we're impacted by decisions that exclude us. So there's no treaty. We're the only colonised Western world that doesn't have a treaty. Um, being an afterthought or out of scope. You know what do you do after you acknowledge country? or you get a welcome to country at a significant, or you have a wrap, what do you do after that? You know, that's, that's what, I, what I look for, you know, and I don't, I got tired of that, I suppose, seeing that in, in consulting world and, and big contract world and research world, that we're always out of scope and that we're not part of the terms of reference. And then they think, oh, shit, the Aboriginal people, quick, get a tender out. We're always after the fact rather than up front. And I suppose that, that, that the way we do business needs to change, you know, thinking along the terms of research is that, you know, how can we make sure that Indigenous people or Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people have a say in what is research? You know, what are their questions? You know, you as, there's, I'm no doubt there's researchers on, on this thing. Think about, you know, you have a question you want answered. You go at them and, and talk to these mobs and build a relationship and they might help you create an answer to your question, but what are their questions? You know, what are what aren't they, what aren't they getting across? You know, they so many times. You know, they get excited when new science comes on board, but the scientists, the collaboration between the Western science and traditional knowledge, can build a better outcome. Um, hearing what we don't have, you know, I got tired of that too. Review after review, review cut and paste. Um, Non-Aboriginal voices telling our story. Promise, there's no disrespect there, but I think it's time. Time for us, um, you know, it's, it's you think about how you do that, how you can facilitate that, but then step back. Um, you know, I saw the recent fish kills um, and we had two independent science inquiries 
on the fish kills, one with through the Academy of Science and one through the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and the Minister. They come up with similar findings, but Aboriginal people weren't seen as experts. They, you know, we, we, they, they trotted out Uncle Badger at a number of occasions to talk about him. But, you know, when you read his submission to the South Australian Royal Commission in the Murray-Darling, that is your evidence. You know, his knowledge is in, input into that, you know, and I think he's not seen as an expert on his own country. Um, and as I said, you know, we're only, we're only storytellers of myth and legend. We're always up the black, that's a, a slip of the, of the L. But we're always up the back of reports and legislation and policy. You know, you might have an acknowledgement up the front, but the guts of, of what we're trying to achieve is always up the back. Everything you see. There's no national strategy for science, water or fire. There's no centre of excellence. And obviously the biggest challenge for us is our, our, our programs are always deleted. Lack of funding, change of government, change of leadership. Too many times that has happened to our, our, our ways of doing. So my methodology, I'm trying to shift the paradigm away from my mob being the research and I want to become the researcher. So I'm trying to fill that space. Please be a champion of this, facilitate. And as I mentioned, if you can make that happen, step back when it's their time. My knowledge, I'm always learning, as I said, is how I relate to my, with my people and my country. And obviously my PhD was for my people, not for me. Um, this differs to Western thinking, and you know, gained and owned individually, trying to fill the void of water management with Camilla Roy Water Science. Be that voice, bang that table, and hopefully one day I'll be banging tables with a PhD. There's a recent article I just did for an Indigenous X session I had on uh, Twitter. And you know, it's, it's, it's talking about our water voice not being at any details. We're not even in the room, we're not even on the same street, unfortunately. Brolga, these are, these are some of these species, you know, if the, the brolga is turning up to our, our wetlands. That's good. That means, you know, that it's right for them to start dancing and it's right for us to start watching them dance and mimic them in, their, in our stories um, and dances. You know, they, if they're turning up, that's a great thing. And, you know, obviously the ducks you can see in the background, if they're turning up as well, that's even better. There's a feed, but also, you know, that the water's good. Aquila audax, the wedgetail tail eagle, um, you know, that's just a, a predator. Um, it's top of the food chain. He, he's, um, he or she. Are, are very important in a lot of Aboriginal dreaming. Some recent resources. So Australian, Australasian Journal of Environmental Management had an Indigenous Water Management Special Edition. Um, Professor Sue Jackson and myself were co-editors, which was unbelievably exciting. Um, so we had Indigenous co-led and authors as part of that. There was case studies, um, New South Wales case study, um, Aboriginal waterways assessments and cultural flows, the Snowy River, the Natanjiri, Fitzroy River and environmental water partnerships. So, you know, that's out there for people to read and that's the filling the space as well. Um, and one of the, the Fitzroy River abstract was written in language. And, you know, that, that could be a first for a journal of, 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 of such. So, um, and... I know there might be something coming soon, hopefully, and it might be a river as the first author, the first author rather than a, a human, and that, that will be exciting as well. Here's some water quality resources. Um, Australian New Zealand water quality guidelines. So I was part of the Joint Steering Committee from 2009 that has <coughs> established some principles, and I sat on that with um, Rukumi Hinui from Te Arawa in Rotorua and um, that was really cool and we got to, to share our knowledge and really have a look at some of the, the issues that were cross-cutting and very similar on the way we value water but also the ways to look forward on how we engage as well and then part of that was to build some guidance for cultural and spiritual values into water quality management. So they're out there so there's no excuse now that water quality managers don't have whereas the previous ANZAC guidelines of 2000 really only said go have a chat to Aboriginal people and see if they've got any water quality issues and tick the box. This is a blueprint so these are my demands sorry um let's say my my suggestions for a future of Indigenous science um 
the Samaros, like you, when you think about indigenize the curricula, that's starting to happen in some universities and obviously the, the curricula at, at high school and, and junior school. But I think that the university sector is in a space that where this can happen. You know, a National First People Science Network. We don't have that pushing for that at the moment. Oh, I've been pushing that for a while, but you know, it's something we it'd be fantastic to have to, to share, to talk. Um, Centre of Excellence for Science, um, scientific research led by Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, using our cultural methodologies and science. You know, First People Science Strategy, the National Science Strategy of 2017. I'm paraphrasing here, but recommends that Aboriginal people do science, do STEM just like women. That's it. That's all we've got to ha hang our hat on. And uh, obviously, you know, National First People Science Fellowships. Um, I'm very honoured to, to be um, offered and, and have accepted, you know, Associate Professor role at University of Canberra. You know, I suppose it's, it's me filling the space. Me and my river selfies. Um, That'll do me. Thanks so much, Brad. That was a really amazing, amazing talk. Uh, and, it, and it absolutely lives up to the 120 people that have been <laughs> listening in and uh, really enjoying it, I'm sure, and also being inspired by what you do and what you are saying. Um, completely so uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do that and, and um, yeah it'd just be great to uh, have a discussion we've got about um, see uh, yeah 25 minutes or so left um, so I'm sure there's quite a few questions discussion points uh, clarification points for Brad um, if you could just maybe um, raise your hand in that box uh, the, the go to the participant function do raise hand that'd be great just so I can keep tabs on that, that would be fantastic. But um, lots of nice comments coming in, Brad, uh, uh, for, your, for your talk. But um, yeah, would anyone like to um, launch off with a question for, for Brad? Sally. First of all, thank you so much for um, your presentation. I, I really appreciated it. Um, one of the things, um, so I teach uh, Indigenous primary school teachers or, or people, pre-service primary school teachers. Um, and I guess uh, what I'm interested in is how can I enable them to, um, to ask the questions that, that they want to ask? As in the teachers or the students? Well, uh, I guess both. I'm teaching pre-service teachers who are themselves Indigenous. Ah, right, cool. And trying, and um, one of the assessments that we get them to do is to um, to write a book uh, that addresses some part of the science curriculum and incorporates a fair test investigation. But how can I ensure that I'm facilitating uh, their questions? Yeah, that's a good question. I suppose the have a look at what resources are out there for, for starters is you know, it's starting to build a body of knowledge and resources like the, the resources we did for Melbourne Uni for the curriculum and it was pretty much to get a teacher to a point to look at look at the curricula look at the indigenous knowledge resources and build a lesson plan out of it and I think that's that's a key part of it as well but also making it making them because the way I saw it was just imagine that one Indigenous kid in that classroom, potentially, and an Indigenous type question come up and they got to talk about their culture. You know, how proud, how passionate they would be. And I suppose it's getting them to ask those questions, you know, like, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why I, I sort of chose science, because I had a million questions. And I thought if I become a scientist about water, I can answer them myself. How cool is that? And I think it's about having them be proud as well, you know, that giving them the tools is key. You know, I think if, if they don't have the resources, then they're under the pump for starters. Um, and if, and if, if they are able to facilitate that as they're teaching as well, you know, like it's, you know, my wife's in early childhood at the moment. Um, she's been there for, for a number of years and, you know, like she tries to do what she can. She's not, she's not Aboriginal, but you know, she's made, she makes sure that the, that indigenous, indigenizing her curricula is in there, you know, that 
She will get elders in. She will do talks. She will not just play a video on Eddie Marbo or something like that. You know, it's, it's more than that. You know, it's, it's got to be more than that. They've, you've got to live this culture. And I suppose it's, it's allowing those teachers to live their culture and share their culture and their knowledge. And I think um, there's a fantastic, there is a fantastic opportunity for that. And if they are educating the next generation, that's even better. I don't know if I answered that. There was a lot of waffle there. Sorry. <clears throat> Great, great job, Brad. Um, there's a few people now um, waiting to, to speak with you. So I'm just going to go to uh, Megan Evans now, please. There's, there's two Megans, so um, that was a roll of the dice about who was going to get there first. Um, thank you. Thanks, Brad, for a really lovely talk. And um, yeah, you provided so much information and, and there's a lot to digest. Um, I was just curious about... Um, uh, you know, your, your comment about um, this this perennial need for Western science to, or the, the perceived need for Western science to feel like it needs to validate um, Indigenous knowledge. Um, and I'm just interested in, in your views. Um, I know it's a huge, huge topic and you've obviously outlined a lot um, in your blueprint and it's not just a silver bullet kind of strategy, but I'm, I'm just curious about the approach in terms of you mentioned that you know western science and indigenous knowledge has different processes of validation um, are there institutional responses to um or possible institutional responsible responses to um uh, prevent that kind of cycle from happening from for it to be more of a um uh, uh, even i guess approach to to allow those processes to co-occur or um, not step on each other um, so is there maybe a body working within the academy of science for example or to to enable that to occur or is it um or maybe part of is it more just on us as um, scientists to really um, take responsibility and um, decolonize our own research approaches to ensure that that validation cycle doesn't continue yeah that's a that's a big one how long we got <laughs> <laughs> um yeah oh, look i think it's like indigenizing the curriculum at in you know in science is, is is one step um from junior to senior to to university level academic level but also you know the idea of bringing indigenous knowledge back to the center you know it's as I, as I mentioned, my son has to do it as an elective. It's not core learning. Uh, they might touch on it that, you know, we we're noble savages and walk, wandering aimlessly around the continent at one point. Um, and I think that bit is bringing that knowledge to the centre, you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as a tested and proven knowledge set that, you know, potentially, well, it, the nature of the beast is that, you know, it has to be validated by Western ways. And if it's to be seen as science, unfortunately, um, and that, that's the world we li live in at the moment. But one day, you know, I'd love to see elders, knowledge holders, people that care for country as fellows of the Academy of Science one day. Or we might have the fellows of uh, the Academy of Indigenous Science. You know, let's say that. But there's another. There's another demand I should ask for. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, that that could be a future, you know, that our elders are seen as equals for their knowledge of their own country. And I think there's, um, that bit doesn't really, it doesn't happen, you know, and I think the perception that, um, you know, I, I kept emphasising that it's, it's folklore, it's myth and legend and it's fiction rather than the celebrating that it's, thousands of generations of observation of one's country, they know it, they live it, they sing it, they dance it. That sort of stuff isn't celebrated. And I think that's the bit that needs to change. And obviously there has to be a cultural shift from the learned academies as well, you know, that they have to start allowing this to happen. You know, like we've, we've seen the, the cultural shift for women in STEM, you know, that's exploded, it's going really well. We're seeing improvement, it's a slow, but it's, you know, the, and I suppose my, my aspect, I don't care, men, women, either. Um, I want more Indigenous people thinking about science 
as a career as well. You know, we need to take that space. You know, we need to tell our stories, tell our science our way, as I mentioned. And I think that's, um, that's something that is up to us. You know, it's, you know, it's up to our educators, but also up to our, our people that get opportunities to talk at Zoom. You know, you, we, are, we are doing that, but I think there needs to be more of it. And obviously the Western system needs to allow that to happen. And, you know, it's not, you know, I know there's, there's doubters out there and um, people will always say, you know, pure scientists will always say that it, it's, you know, that knowledge isn't a science, but it is, it, they are different in so many ways. But I think if the bits that overlap, we can do business better. Kev? <clears throat> Sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks, Brad. Thanks for the great question. I'm just going to Megan McNally now, uh, next, and then so we've got Richard, then Barry Williams. Uh, thanks, Brad. That's uh, another evocative presentation that you've given us. Have you got any examples of governments that might be doing it well? Um, no. Oh dear. <laughs> well, to be honest, in the water space, um, Northern Territory has created opportunities for not in the, not in the science. I'm, I'll talk about the water world first. Um, Victoria is doing some some great stuff. You know, they have the the. Um, Yarra River Protection at the Birrarung. So they have that, you know, they have, and the, the Wurundjeri are a key part of that. You know, they are sitting at the table talk, talking about their, their connection to their river. Um, Victoria committed 9.7 million number of years ago to create an Aboriginal water unit and also obviously opportunities in water. So that, you know, Victoria is probably the best of the worst. Um, New South Wales has gone back to the 1950s. Um, WA does nothing, Tassie does nothing. You just got to read the Productivity Commission, it's all there. Um, and a lot of that's been copy um, and paste. How about international governments? Um, I suppose the, the best thing that's happening is there's an expert panel on, on fire and you know there is an Indigenous person on that, um, which is fantastic. And there's obviously people at um, community level, uh, at um, stakeholder level that are in heavily involved in that. And so they're starting to influence that way. Um, threatened species is another area where indigenous people are involved. And obviously the ranger programs that are happening around the country, um, they are fantastic examples of Aboriginal people caring for country. They're getting, they're getting bugger all, but they're, they're, they're getting so much out of it. You know, they're, they're paid little to make Australia look great again. Um, and that, that is no way a Trumpism, sorry. I'll stay away from that. Um, but, you know, those, those rangers are caring for country. They are doing, you know, part of their custodial responsibilities, cultural responsibilities. Um, you know, the, they are happier and healthier for doing that. And it's obviously, there's a lot of benefits in that. And I suppose that, that style at a national level is a good thing. Um, but at a science level, uh, we're still, um, I think there was a recent report by the chief scientist and science technology in Australia, Misha, are you nodding? <laughs> um, there was an opportunity, there was something there that, you know, but it's still, we haven't, we haven't progressed in that space. Um, we're still, we're still at low numbers and we're not obviously we're not doing it right at the moment. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Um, and moving on to Richard Beggs and then Barry Williams after that. Uh, hi, Bradley. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment on cultural attitudes to the noisy miner, a native species that is interpreted by scientists as, as being a, an ecological problem. But that problem has arisen because of our uh, modifications to landscapes. Now, I'm quite interested in finding some indigenous perspectives currently to that species. I've, I've found lots of historical references to it where um, indigenous people have expressed views mm. about species. And I've pretty much drawn a blank. Uh, where do I begin to try and incorporate that kind of knowledge into my research without me attributing 
uh, values to indigenous groups. Yeah, that, that's that's I suppose a common challenge is that you know they might be perceived that they're, they're they're significant to someone, but you've got to find that right mob. And you know, there's 250 different mobs, language groups. You can come talk to me. My kids are noisy miners. They're bloody noisy as, but <laughs> um, but. That is, that is a challenge, you know, like there's um, a project I'm involved in looking at the cultural value of the Australian Bitten. You know, if it's not culturally significant or there's no stories, there's no connection to it, then, you know, it might have been a bird that come and went. But noisy miners, potentially, they might have, they might have traditional names in, in some languages. Yeah, they certainly do. Um, yeah, and I suppose it's, it's identifying that mob that might have a name, but they might have a connection. Um, if, if it's someone's totem, you know, then obviously they're they're a chatterbox. But um, if it's if it's if it's not culturally significant, it's not culturally significant. But it might be just part of the the, the total ecosystem. Um, it, that's a tricky one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, Barry, over to you. I think you're unmuted now. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Hey, good day, Well done, mate. That's a Thanks. Good presentation. Um, look, I. I really take on board your point of um, indigenising the curricula, but I think uh, equally stronger, or equal if not stronger, point is that we need to decolonise the academy, you know, that they, for us to step into that space, they have to make room for us in that space, and, you know, I see a lot of um, white people who are still not wanting to give up their stranglehold, um, which is not uh, you know, I've got some some of my best friends are white, but um, <laughs> but um, you know there are people. I see Dave Johnston on here. You know, I had to meet up with Dave uh, mm -hmm. one one in his bitch. I thought that was going to be a triple A this year, but it won't be. But you know, so there's, there's that as well. Um, and finally, can I be an adjunct in your academy when you establish it? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> That was just a comment more than a question. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, man, I couldn't agree. And I think it, it is a, a cultural shift by the, the learned academies to, 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 I suppose, broaden their horizons and be a bit more open to, to this sort of thing because it's, you know, it's, you know, if, if you're in this science STEM space, you know, I've been in it for, you know, let's say 20 odd years and, you know, it's been bloody lonely. Um, and I think it's it's something that, um, you know, you mentioned Dave, you know, he's been an archaeologist for since, since the, since the fish traps were built. <laughs> and, you know, there's things like that, that, you know, we're, there's a lot of us individuals that are out there, you know, I think about like a, in the groundwater space, you know, three years ago, or so let's say four years ago, I thought I was potentially one of the only indigenous hydrogeologists out there. And then I find out there's a, a young lass in Adelaide, and then I find out there's another another um, indigenous hydrogeologist. So my network went from one to three in a couple of years, you know. So that sort of stuff is we need to build on it and celebrate it. But you know, it's how can we do we get together as a as a STEM community? Do we get together as a science community? You know, and I think there are, are other areas. You know, there's some mobs that that, that do it better. You know, the engin indigenous engineers do it okay. Um, there's even a Aboriginal Dentist Association. How has that happened? And we don't even have an Aboriginal scientist um, network. So I think, you know, we need to, to get our shit together. Yeah. And it's, and obviously we need that support as well uh, to build, build those networks to support each other, but then share knowledge uh, and become stronger. And, you know, you build up those mentor systems and then you have the, the peer, um, peer to peer, to peer sort of scenarios where you have a, an Indigenous student thinking about science, you have an Indigenous scientist and you have a Western scientist all working together or you might have an elder in there as well, you know, that they're all come together to support this one student through science, through, you know, like while I was at CSIRO for all that, a number of years, I had in my um, annual review, I want an Indigenous science mentor. I'm still, still waiting for one. So I, from the men from being the mentee, I, I had to become the mentor, you know, and I thought, how do you do this? You know, and I think that's the stuff that I don't want to happen to another generation. Yeah. We've got time for probably one or two last questions. If anyone wants to um, 
There's some great uh, discussion going on in the chat box. Um, I'll go to Anthony. Uh, I've got Anthony and Karina. Anthony, go for it. Yep. Oh, hey, hey there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brad, for the great presentation. Um, one thing, so I'm at the University of Wollongong, and uh, one thing, and I'm in the, in the school where we teach environmental science, so really it should be a no-brainer uh, to get indigenous knowledge on board. Uh, but we're a long way uh, to go. And, and one thing I'd like to see happening here is in science, or what we call in Western culture science, mm. uh, a degree of indigenous knowledge. Mm. So to really see um, indigenous knowledge and Western science at, at the same level. Uh, mm. yeah. I'm joking here that I'd like to call that a Bachelor of Indigenous Civilization, but I think. Uh, People will think that's obvious. I'm having a stab at that bachelor of uh, so-called Western. Western civilization. Yes. Uh, but my question, and uh, it's a bit vague, and I'm sorry for that, but uh, where do we start? I've been talking to people here, obviously, uh, and I need to talk to more people. Mm. But where do we start to achieve uh, this sort of endeavor? Mm. Yeah, good question. And I think, yeah, I think, Barry sort of mentioned it as well, like decolonizing, but also indigenizing the, the curricula as well. And, you know, you, you've got Vanessa Kavanagh, who's, who's on, on this chat, you know, she's at Uni of Wollongong and doing a PhD, Indigenous Women's Role in Fire, you know, so that's, that's you know, there's people in your potential close network, and, they, and I believe there is Indigenous curricula taught at Uni of Wollongong. Um, and so there are those opportunities, but, you know, like when I think about that exact question, you know, that, that's that's a huge dream to have that sort of um, course or, or bachelor or um, PhD or master's opportunities for that. You know, I was, I was at the, a number of years ago, I was at the Kimberley Rangers Forum in Dampier Peninsula, I ticked off the bucket list as well while I was there, but I mean, uh, one of the remotest place, places on, on the continent and this young fella gets up from, from that part of the world and, you know, it was part of all the welcoming ceremony. He just said, you know, he was a young ranger um, learning, learning his, 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 um, his craft, his, his trade. He's getting traditional knowledge, but he said he wanted to be an environmental scientist, but he didn't want to leave his country. You know, so that sort of challenges are there for universities as well to, to change how we deliver um, courses as well. You know, if he chooses to be an environmental scientist, how can we... You know, we as, you know, university people facilitate that, you know, and I think that's a, that's a challenge for the sector itself. And, you know, as we move to a Zoom world, hence what we're on today, you know, that, that this sort of style of learning is, could be our future, you know, and can we make sure that happens? And if there are young people keen to, to think about science, we've got to make sure we can make that happen, um, you know, yeah. Thanks, Brad. Okay, uh, last question from Karina Judd. Hi, um, thank you so much, Brad. Um, and my question actually really leans into that. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch on what you were speaking before about um, having these kind of, with indigen um, indigenizing <laughs> the, the curriculum and, and having these networks, you know, where would you like to see that kind of thing start in, in really incorporating I think it's a really great analogy you used of having the women in STEM, say, decadal mm. plan that's come mm. out of the academy. But where would you like to see that start? Yeah, look, there's things happening now. Um, um, I had infiltrated the system or infiltrated <laughs> the dome. Um, I was on the Academy of Sciences external advisory committee for their RAP, you know. So there's, there, there was things in their RAP that, that talk about creating the opportunity for an Indigenous Science Network talking with Science Technology Australia, the other, the other Academy of Science Technology, um, Engineering, was it ATSI? Academy of Technology, Science and Engineering. So yeah, now those, those, and the Academy of Social Science. So looking at what they have and what opportunities we can have with those academies, um, you know, there's, there's opportunities out there at the moment. Um, you know, we've got the Indigenous, Girls STEM Academy through CSIRO, um, but you know that's only half the gap. Um, we've still got the boys, so my you know my son he doesn't have that opportunity. Um, we've got um, oh, let's see, sorry, 
Um, but I think that the, the shift is hopefully changing. The discussions are happening. I think it, ideally we want indigenous led grassroots opportunities for Western scientists, obviously, you know, um, fellows of academies to, to link in with us, to help us, to guide us, be our advisory committee. Because that's, that's the thing I'm also tired of, always being an advisory committee and no one takes your advice. So it's us actually making those decisions for, for our, our fellow Indigenous scientists. Um, you know, that, that could be, you know, like the, yeah, we mentioned the Women in STEM, the SAGE, the Science and Gender Equity through the Academy. You've also got the um, Queers in STEM. They're, they're, they're going along nicely. Um, you've also got the Early Mid-Career Researchers Network. So that's happening and I suppose we need, we can build off that. Um, and you know, we've just done a survey, just a survey has been sent out for, for members of Science Technology Australia to identify Aboriginal scientists within the membership of SDA. So, you know, that's really cool. So hopefully we might get a number of um, uh, institutions or um, societies that actually, you know, send it out to their members and then obviously Indigenous people put their hand up and say, yes, so I'm a member of six of those academies, I think. So there's six people. That's only one, sorry. <laughs> but it's, um, it's um, yeah, look, it's, and like all busy people, it's hard. You just need that support network as well. So you need that, that um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? When you get support, you have a, uh, I don't know, someone that helps you facilitate those opportunities, you know, an exec, um, executive type person yeah. where, they, you know, can run the, the databases and send out the emails. And then ultimately, you know, I'd, I'd love it, get to the point where we have the, the, the mentoring projects, we have, you know, maybe get to the point where we have a journal, we have an annual conference, that sort of stuff of sharing of what we've learned, what we know works and you know that sort of stuff into the future is is, is my pipe dream yeah so yeah, yeah, look it's absolutely. hopefully it's changing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it'd be great to see that and to see like non-indigenous people being your advocates as well yeah yeah, yeah. we love our champions yeah. i just want this opportunity to say thanks so much for great questions great presentation great uh, debate and, and, and discussion down in the box and i hope that we can welcome you back again brad at some later point to talk about any one of a number of other uh, topics you, you can you can talk to but yeah thanks very much for joining us uh, folks and this um this will be this recording will be available uh, uh we'll probably end up uh, tweeting it maybe or putting it on the sociology uh, web page but it will be available for people to listen to at another point so thanks so much again for the for your for your contribution brad and for all the great discussion that ensued thank you thanks everyone yeah, thanks so much.